Oh my, look at this thing. Eye level with me, that ain't going to work. And y'all knew Brother Cameron was supposed to be preaching too, so I don't know why that thing's up so high. My goodness. No, but I am very thankful for the opportunity to preach. Uh, I hate that Brother Cameron could not do this. Uh, he did want me to let y'all know, though, uh, that uh, he, he hates that he could not be here. He also wanted me to let you know that he's glad that he got a better preacher to do it, though. Luke chapter 3. Now, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, the message that I bring you this morning was originally three different sermons that I have sutured together uh, for the sake of this preaching hour. Uh, and I'll tr simply introduce this text by telling you that Luke was preparing the reader in this portion that we're going to be reading. He was preparing the reader to hear about the baptism of Jesus. Now, the way he sets the stage for the baptism of Jesus is by summarizing the ministry of the one who baptized Jesus, of John the Baptist. Now, who here would say that John's ministry was unsuccessful? Well, none of us would. If you agreed to that, you're a lunatic. Uh, we know that John's ministry was successful. And I'd wager that all of us want a ministry just as successful as his. Now, here's the thing. Let's not think that a successful ministry is defined by uh, a plethora of professions of faith and baptisms and having the big crowd. That's, that's not uh, the, the baseline of success. The standard of success is dictated by your dedication to God's calling on your life. John was dedicated to God's calling. And I want to emulate John's ministry in my own. And so we're going to be covering this passage here. Uh, now, we're not going to be starting with our text. I just kind of want to use this as a jumping off point. Luke chapter 3 and verses 2 and 3. And Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. You see that? The word of God came to him. And what did he do with it? He went and he preached it. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, Lord. And Father, I do thank you, God, for this opportunity to preach, Lord. Father, I am trembling, God. And Father, I am nervous, Lord. But Father, you know my heart, God. You know that I am nervous for the wrong reason, Lord. Father, I'm nervous because I stand before colleagues and preachers, God, and former instructors. Father, I pray that you would remove that nervousness from my heart, God, and instill the true reason to be nervous in my heart, Lord. Father, because I am handling your word of truth. Father, I pray that, I, that you would hide your word from error this morning, God. Father, that you would help me to rightly exposit your word, Lord, to expose uh, the true intentions of your word, God. Father, that we all might feast upon it and grow thereby, Lord. Father, we thank you for the example of John, Lord. And Father, it's my prayer that everyone here, God, would emulate the life and ministry of John, Lord. Father, not for just us pastors, Lord, not for just us preachers, but everyone here, God, because we are all to be proclaimers, Father, of the gospel of Christ. We are all to be preparing people to meet Jesus, Lord. Father, help us to be like your, uh, your, your servant, John, God. Father, even more than that, help us to be like your son, Christ. Father, we're thankful for the sacrifice of Christ, Lord. Father, I ask that you would move your spirit freely through this services, Lord. Father, we do pray for Brother Cameron, God. Father, we pray for all the prayer requests. Father, we pray for the speakers of this upcoming session next week, Lord. Father, again, I ask that you would bless me and use me this morning, Lord. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins and where I fail you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So here comes John, following God's calling on his life, preparing the world to meet the Messiah. Now we know Luke is giving us a summary of John's ministry because in verse 20, as we're going to read, what happens? John gets arrested. Well, then what happens in verses 21 and 22? Well, Jesus gets baptized. Okay, so this is not a chronological recollection of the events. This is a summary of John's ministry. Uh, and we're going to see three points. Uh, we're going to see three details uh, that categorize, that describe the ministry of John. First of all, we see that John was a proclaimer of repentance. He was a proclaimer of repentance. His ministry could be summarized as he preached repentance to the people. Now, before we get very far, we've got to define that term. What is repentance? It's a turning away. It's a change of mind. It's doing a 180. You go from looking at one thing to looking at what's in the opposite direction of it. Uh, understand that repentance is just the turning. That's all it is. It's not the actual act of walking away. We've got to understand that about repentance. 
Now, if you do truly repent, what's going to logically happen afterward? Well, then you will walk the other direction from the direction you were going. But repentance itself is just the turning away. And as far as salvation goes, it looks like this. You turn from unbelief to belief. You turn from looking to yourself to looking to Jesus. You turn from looking at wickedness and sin to setting your gaze upon righteousness and holiness. Here's a practical example, a true story. Uh, when I was a child, I believed that chocolate milk came from brown cows. Okay? White milk came from the normal white and black house, and strawberry milk, that was an anomaly, and I was certain that the leading scientists of the age were trying to work out that mystery. Uh, but I was confronted with facts. Okay? I was proved wrong, so I repented of my false notion, and then I believed the truth. I changed my mind. That's what repentance is, changing your mind about something. And to be saved, you've got to change your mind about a few things. You've got to change your mind about yourself. You've got to change your mind about your sin. And you've got to change your mind about Jesus. You've got to admit that sin is evil and that it's deserving of the holy judgment of a holy God. You've got to admit that you are a sinner. And that puts you in a bad position. And then you've got to admit that Jesus is your only hope. That's repentance. And this is what John spent his ministry proclaiming. Notice that repentance was proclaimed in verses 7 through 8. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. And begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now it's because of Matthew chapter 3 that we know that these individuals he's speaking to, that they're the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he calls them a brood of vipers. He wasn't afraid to use harsh metaphors. He wasn't going to avoid saying what needed to be said. Now that doesn't mean that he was unnecessarily uh, crass, however. But he was telling them that they were snakes. He was telling them that they were sinful. He was telling them that uh, their works-based religion was poisoning the people. So what does he tell them to do? He tells them to repent. He says, it's not enough that you're Jews. It's not enough that you're Abraham's seed. That's not enough. That doesn't warrant salvation. You have got to repent and believe. Repentance was proclaimed and repentance was prescribed. Look at verse 9. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. This is why repentance is necessary. See, John's goal, hear me well, John's goal wasn't just to get people to profess salvation. His goal wasn't just for people to say that they were saved when in reality they weren't. His goal wasn't to brag and boast that he baptized 20 some odd people this past month. He wasn't concerned with anything so shallow. He was concerned with human souls that hung in the balance of life and death. Who would be a good doctor? One who sees you have some illness, but does not prescribe you the necessary medicine to route out that illness, or the one who does? Who would be a good doctor? One who tells you that you should eat as much as you want, smoke your lungs out, and take no thought for your health, or the one who demands that you live a healthy lifestyle. Give me that second doctor, because that first one doesn't care if I live or die. Likewise, the preacher that doesn't prescribe or demand repentance is a preacher who does not care if you suffer eternal death or enjoy eternal life. He doesn't care. Let me go back to what I said earlier. Repentance is just a changing of the mind. It is just a turning away. But true repentance and belief will result in salvation. And here's the thing. John's telling us true repentance will also result in holiness. True salvation is going to result in holiness. One old preacher back in the locomotive days, uh, which Brother Mike is familiar with, he illustrated it this way. He said, if you were on a train... And suddenly you, you realize that you're going, you're on the wrong train. You're going the wrong way. Uh, well, you, what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to change your mind about what train you're on, right? And what's going to logically happen after that? You're going to get off that train, and you're going to get on the other one, going the other direction. 
Okay, and it, GPS, right? What happens? Uh, you're, you're going the wrong way, and your GPS tells you about a million and one times uh, to turn around and rerouting. You finally realize the thing is right, so what do you do? You turn around and you go where it's telling you to, do, uh, to go. If you truly repent, then it will naturally result in actions aligning with that repentance. If you are truly saved, then it will naturally result in actions that show, that demonstrate that you are saved. That's what the book of James teaches. James said, I'll show you my faith. How? By my works. Not that I'll be saved by my works, but if I am truly saved, if I truly have placed my faith in Christ Jesus, what will happen? I will demonstrate works of righteousness. It is unavoidable. Jesus taught us what in Matthew 7? That there are two kinds of people. That there are two kinds of trees. A good tree and a bad tree. The bad tree will produce bad fruit. The good tree will produce good fruit. It will happen. I love the illustration that Charles Spurgeon used. He said this. He said, suppose you have a sheep and a pig. A pig wanders up to a mud hole. What's the pig going to do? That's right. He's going to wallow in it. He's going to jump in. He's going to roll around in it. He's going to eat in it. He's just going to play in it because he loves the mud. Well, a sheep, he wanders up next to a mud hole and he falls in, right? Maybe it was kind of intentional. Maybe it wasn't, but he falls in. What's he going to do? He's going to get up out of that mud hole, man. He's going to try to shake that mud off. He's going to hate that he was ever in that mud hole. He's going to try to shake that mud off and go his way. Why? Why do these two different creatures have two totally different reactions to the mud? Because they're of two different natures. Because they are two different creatures. In the same way, the saved person and the lost person, they have a totally different reaction to sin. The lost person's like the pig that just jumps straight into it. The saved person, we might fall into it from time to time. We might fall into it a lot. But we're going to get up out of it. We're going to shake ourselves off. We're going to beg God for mercy and forgiveness. We're going to repent and repent and repent again and go forward. This is what John was prescribing. And notice that he personalizes repentance. We see uh, repentance personalized in verses 10 through 14. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answereth and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. See, this is what happened in verse 10 and 11. Uh, these people, they were wondering, Okay, well, I've got to show repentance. Well, how do I do that, John? And so John, he gives a general idea of what repentance demonstrated is, what it looks like. It looks like charity. It looks like generosity. One preacher put it like this. He said, the, uh, the, the demonstration of God's mercy in your life, it's not determined by how much theology you know, how many books you read, but your active goodness to people in misery and in need. True repentance is going to look like Jesus, who is charitable. Jesus, who is generous. Jesus, who is compassionate. Jesus, who is forgiving. Jesus, who is merciful. Jesus, who is loving. That's demonstration of repentance for all Christians. But in verse 12 and 14, we see that repentance will also, in some sense, be stylized to the individual. The tax collectors, what, what, was, what were they told? Well, hey, stop robbing from people. <laughs> Maybe you should stop robbing from people and give. And that's exactly what Zechariah did, isn't it? When Zechariah got saved, he had a complete change. And as a tax collector, he no longer uh, stole from individuals. He gave back uh, what he had stolen. Again, the soldiers, they were given specific instructions. And what I'm getting at here is this, preacher. You need to be willing to work with your people to personally disciple them. John worked with these individuals on a case-by-case -case basis. If you were going to be an effective minister, you need to do that. You need to personally disciple your people. If you want a successful ministry, you're going to proclaim repentance. You've got to preach to the lost to repent and believe in Christ. And you've got to preach to the saved to show fruit of repentance. Second thing that categorizes John's ministry, 
pointing to the Redeemer, pointing to the Redeemer. I'll try to go through this quickly. I know we're already running out of time here. Uh, first of all, we see that he, was, uh, he got the attention off of himself. Uh, remember that? Uh, uh, how the, the people came to him and they were wondering, hey, like, is this, are, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Verse 15. And as the people were in expectation and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them, All I indeed baptize you with water, but one might, uh, mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you. So what's John doing? He's getting the attention off of himself. John had a golden opportunity here to build a, a Joel Osteen ministry. Here were these people. Understand how much people love John. After he was imprisoned, he still had disciples. He still had a giant following. Uh, Josephus, I recently read uh, uh, in Josephus uh, why Josephus believed uh, that Herod imprisoned John. Now, we know the spiritual reason, but here's a practical reason as well. Josephus was scared of John because John had a giant following, and if John wanted to uh, raise a revolt against Herod, he could have. He had that big of a following. Okay? And so, look, uh, these people, they were ready to believe John was the Messiah. He could have said, yeah, that's him. Worship me. He could have done that. But what does he do instead? He gets the attention off of himself. He says, no, 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 no. This is not about me. If you're going to be an effective minister, if you're going to be an effective Christian, get the attention off of yourself. We must kill pride. We've got to kill it. Get the attention on sin. Look at verse 17. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. And will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with the fire unquenchable. This is a common picture in the Bible of uh, judgment for sin. This idea of the chaff being burned. And John is saying, hey, look, this Messiah, when he does come, it's not me, but when he does come, you know what he's going to do? He's going to judge the world for sin. He's going to cast some of y'all into fire because you're unbelievers and unregenerate. Why? Because you are sinners and you refuse to repent of that sin and put your faith in Christ. He's letting them know, hey, look, this is the issue. The issue is not, it's nothing to do with me. The issue is, you are a sinner. You are a sinner. We all are. My old uh, pastor, Brother Britt Dupree, and I know some of you just cringe at hearing his name, right? I do too. Um, Brother Britt shared with me something that I will never forget. He told me, always lead the physical into the spiritual. Every time you're dealing with people. Lost people, saved people, church people, people outside of the church. Always lead the physical into the spiritual. Always make a beeline to the gospel. And we've we got to understand something here. We've got to get the attention on sin if we want people to get saved. We, we've got to understand this. So many people want to just proclaim, well, God loves you and has a plan for your life. Have you ever said that? And witnessed, That's the first thing you said. Well, God loves you and has a plan for your life. I pray that you don't ever again. What if Noah had painted on the side of the ark, God loves you, and had a plan for your life? That sure would have helped those drowning people. When we tell somebody, God loves you and has a plan for your life, that's the first thing that we say. We leave it at that. You know what the lost person thinks? Great! I love me and I've got a plan for my life. God does love you and He does have a plan for your life. But before we get to that, before we give them the good news, they've got to understand the bad news. That we are sinners deserving of judgment. What does it matter if Christ died to save you if you have no idea what He died to save you from? We've got to get the attention on sin. And then we can get the attention on our Savior. Verse 16, what does He do? He points to Jesus. And indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. He gets the attention on Jesus. That's what our li- if we're Christians, that's what our lives need to be characterized by. My life is not about me. My life is not about Joseph Schwartz anymore. My life is supposed to be about Jesus Christ. My life is supposed to be categorized by getting people's attention on the Savior. Final point, the final thing that we see about John's ministry here, this description of it, was that he was persecuted for righteousness in verses 18 through 20. Many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother (laughs) Philip's wife, uh, and for the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. 
Notice the details of John's persecution. Uh, he was arrested for Herodias, uh, for Herod's uh, wife who was uh, so Herod Antipas, uh, this takes a little bit of historical context here. Herod Antipas, Herod Philip, half-brothers, both sons of Philip the Great. Uh, they had a couple of other half-brothers. Uh, their half-niece, uh, well, I guess that's a half-niece, I don't know how this works. Uh, they, one of their half-brothers had a daughter. That was Herodias. Philip marries his niece. Eh, that's pretty gross, right? Uh, and so what is, uh, what is Herod and Antipas, the Herod mentioned here, what does he do? Well, he kind of likes her. She kind of likes him too. So he divorces his wife. Uh, and then uh, Herodias divorces Philip. And then they get married to one another. Oh, and by the way, uh, Philip and uh, Herodias' daughter Salome married another one of the uncles. Okay, So like the Herod family. Man, th this family tree had roots where it should have had leaves and branches where it should have. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a mess, okay? And so it, it, here's another thing, cherry on top. It was uh, against the Jewish law to marry your brother's wife while she was alive. So what does John do? He goes up to Herod. He says, man, this is sick. What are you doing? Repent. Get to, you got to fix this situation. This is not a marriage that is pleasing to God. John was not afraid to call out the political leaders of his day. He was not afraid to do it. And then what happened? Herodias, she arrested him. And then what happens? For, we think that for maybe uh, at most a year, John is in prison, uh, and Her Herod occasionally lets John preach for him. We're told why. Uh, if you really want to read more, uh, Matthew 14, Mark, uh, Mark chapter 6, I believe, um, uh, he fact-checked me on that. But anyways, uh, the other, the Synoptic Gospels detail the, uh, the imprisonment of John much more. Uh, and what happened was, Herod didn't want to put John to death for two reasons. One, he was scared of God, we're told. And this is something I have come to find to be true in my life. The people who, don't, or who claim to not know God, they are still very much afraid of God. Maybe it's because they match that Romans chapter 1 description. But he was afraid of what God would do to him should he kill John. And by the way, another thing Josephus wrote about that I found super interesting, Herod's ex-wife, uh, her dad was the king of Arabia. And so you know what this dude does whenever Herod divorces his daughter? He raises up an army. And so Herod raises up an army. And what happens? Herod's army gets completely destroyed. Evidently, the Jews in the first century, they attributed this to God. They believed that this whole army of Herod was destroyed because Herod had killed John the Baptist. So Herod, he was scared of John, but also he liked John's preaching. He was entertained by it. One preacher once said that Herod was charmed by the Word of God, but not changed by the Word of God. Mm. What about you? Are you merely charmed by the Word of God, or are you changed by it? We need to be changed by it. And we need to pray. We need to pray for our ministries and for the ministries of our brothers, that, the, the, that those that hear us preach, that they would not just merely be charmed, but changed by the Word of God. So Herod didn't want to kill. Uh, he didn't want to kill John. Uh, but Herodias did. She never forgave him for calling out her sins like that. And so what happens? Well, Herod has a birthday party, uh, which is a markedly Greco-Roman thing to do. Uh, Jews didn't do birthday parties. He throws a birthday party. He has all these generals and kings and, uh, and rich folk, you know, come to this thing. And, and then he has his niece slash daughter-in-law, whatever, Salome, uh, she comes and she dances. We believe it was a sensual dance. Uh, everybody was well pleased. And so Herod says, okay, well, I'm going to grant you anything. I'll give you one wish up to half my kingdom. And so she asked her mom, what should I ask for? And Herodias says, ask for the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. And so she does. And Herod, you know why the Bible, the Bible tells us why Herod, even though he liked John, even though he was scared of John's God, the, the reason why he did it, was because of his vow and because of his guests. Herod killed John the Baptist because his pride was on the line. Pride makes us do stupid things. Now, not only was he killed because of Herod's pride, he was killed because of Herodias' anger at preaching against her sins. That's why he was killed. And I think we get so desensitized by uh, media today, by books, by movies, by video games, stuff like beheadings. This is a gruesome thing. This is a sad thing. This is a horrible, wicked thing that happened to John. John was a faithful servant to the Lord God, and ultimately he was persecuted for righteousness' sake. But you want to know something? There's no greater blessing in life 
There's no greater blessing in life than get to, to follow the footsteps of Jesus and die for the faith. There's nothing better than that. We don't understand that, but it's true. Now look, I'm not suggesting you get a martyr complex, okay, and start trying to be persecuted. Don't be one of these dummies that goes on Facebook and causes some stu stupid mess, uh, causes some strife on Facebook just so people can comment on there and tell you how much they're angry at you. That's, that's not what God's got in mind by persecution. That's not what He's got in mind by martyrdom. Don't develop a martyr complex. But, should we ever get to a point in our country, or if you, the Lord ever sends you to a foreign field where this could happen, uh, and, uh, and you should have to lose your life for the sake of the gospel, then my friend, know that there is no greater blessing in life. And I personally believe there would probably be no greater rewards given in heaven uh, than for the martyrs. But this is what I want us to understand. Those are the details of John's persecution. Notice the lessons from John's persecution. First of all, preaching is offensive. Now here's the thing. We aren't to try to make it more offensive than it already is. Uh, we are to be gentle. We are to be compassionate. We are to be patient with individuals. Okay? We need to withhold our temper. The Bible says, be angry in what? Sin not. Okay? But preaching in and of itself is offensive. Why? Well, because nobody wants to hear that they're not a good person. Nobody wants to hear that they are naturally deserving of hell. Nobody wants to hear that God sends people to hell for their sins. Oh, well, Brother Joseph, God doesn't send anybody. He casts. He casts them into the lake of fire. Of course He sends them to hell. Amen. Stop telling people that He doesn't. He does. You've got to be bold in your preaching. Don't pull your punches. God is a judge, a holy one, and He hates sin, and He punishes sin. He does the casting. People don't like to hear that. But you know what? John didn't care if it was offensive. He preached it because he knew people needed it. It didn't matter to him that Herod and Herodias would one day kill him. But hit him. He loved them so much that he gave them the gospel. We've got to love people enough to give them the gospel, even if it is offensive to them, knowing it will be offensive to them. D.L. Moody preached a, a set of revivals, I believe it was, in, in the United Kingdom. And, you know, he was much like John, had a successful ministry. And, and there are these British preachers that, uh, that came to his hotel and they asked, wanted to know, how, how are you so successful in your evangelism? So he takes them to the window of his hotel room, and he points down to a park below the hotel, and he asks them, describe for me what you see. I see a man, you know, holding his daughter's hand walking through the park. I see, uh, I see another man wearing a brown hat, you know, I see some kids playing on the swings. And they turn to him and they say, Brother Moody, what, what do you see? With tears in his eyes, D.O. Moody says, I see souls marching towards the gates of hell. We've got to see things the same way John the Baptist saw people. Souls marching towards the gates of hell. And we've got to love them enough to offend them with the gospel. Preaching is offensive and preaching is opposed. John the Baptist was opposed. We've got to understand something, though, that people are not the enemy. They will be offended, but people are not the enemy. The Bible tells us, the Apostle Paul wrote to us, that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, with powers and principalities, with the rulers of darkness in high places. And I probably butchered that, that quotation. But our enemy is the devil, and he will oppose preaching. But remember, my friend, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Uh, the gate of hell will not prevail against the expansion, the building up of Christ's church, the expansion of his kingdom. So be bold, knowing who you fight for and who fights for you. Preaching is ongoing. It's interesting that Luke chronicles all this. John was incarcerated and died halfway through Christ's ministry. But when does he record this? In chapter 3. He's got, <laughs> he's got a lot more gospel to go through, doesn't he? What's he telling us here? Now this, this was not the end of the proclamation of the gospel that it continued on. Many great saints who have gone on before us, have, have passed away. Maybe they have given their lives to the, uh, for the cause of the cross. Maybe, maybe they were allowed to uh, minister faithfully until just their dying breath at an old age. Uh, but the, the gospel has continued. 
the gospel has continued. The gospel is bigger than us. We need to put our hands to the plow, but we should never think that we are so big. This is John the Baptist. Of all the Old Testament prophets, Jesus said, who, what, he said this, was, this was the greatest man that ever been born. But you know what? God's kingdom work continued. We should never be uh, so prideful that we think that it stops at us. Now, finally, preaching is obligatory. And I know that that word normally has like kind of a negative connotation, but obligatory literally just means demanded or decreed. Uh, and you know what? Our great King, Jesus Christ, what has He done? He has given us a divine, uh, holy edict to go spread the gospel. He has given us the great commission. The great commission to do what? To make them, to mark them, and to mentor them. That's the three steps of the Great Commission. It doesn't just stop with teaching them and preaching to them the gospel. You baptize them, you mark them, and then you do what? You teach them to observe all things that Christ has commanded. You, you mentor them as well. Our King has told us, you must do this. We don't have a choice. We really don't. I mean, obviously we do, but, but we're, it's not constructed for us to, to, to say no to the choice. We're supposed to say, yes, Lord, I will. I will go herald your gospel. John the Baptist said, it doesn't matter if I die, I will preach. I will preach. I will preach. What of you? Will you preach? I thank you for this opportunity. Let us close in prayer.